Good evening. It's October 18th, 2018. This is a meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the council president, so I'll be presiding tonight. These proceedings are being audio and video recorded, and we'll begin, as we always do, with public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. We ask you only to keep it to three minutes or, or fewer. And please remember that it's your time to give your opinion to us. We don't engage in a back and forth with you. And the reason for those things is just to make sure everyone is heard fairly and gets equal time. So I will start with the sign-up sheet. After I've exhausted it, I'll throw it open to anyone else who may wish to speak. The first person is Sarah McCune. Uh, please. And if you would give your name and address for the record, and the floor is yours. Hey, good evening. My name is Sarah McEwen from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, 30 Locust Street. And I am the nursing director of the emergency department at Cooley Dickinson, and I've been a nurse for 33 years. And it has always been a great privilege for me to provide care to those that are sick, injured, or vulnerable. In my role as a nursing director, I see firsthand how nurses, doctors, and other clinicians work together to provide extraordinary care to our patients. Their <coughs> expertise and critical thinking cannot be reduced to a numbers game. Patients are not numbers, and neither are nurses. I am gravely concerned about the inevitable consequences of question one is to pass. I am concerned about access to care. If the hospital is required to maintain rigid nurse-patient ratios, nurses will be pulled from community-based programs, specifically mental health outpatient services, limiting access to this vulnerable population. I am concerned about access of care. If an ambulance responds to a 911 call and brings a patient to the emergency department where the nurses are at their maximum ratio, the paramedic will not be able to hand the care of the patient over to a nurse until the nurse has room in their fixed ratio to accept the patient. Ambulances will either be waiting in the hospital driveways or forced to hospital shop for an emergency <coughs> department that has a ratio allowing for them to accept a patient. This will take the ambulance out of service for longer periods of time unable to respond to other emergencies that might come in during that time. Imagine if a critical patient is brought to the emergency department by a family member and the nurses were all at their maximum ratio. Nurses will be forced to either care for that patient and incur a $25,000 fine or have the patient wait. <coughs> question one not only, question one only allows exemptions in the case of a state declared public health emergency not for the every day-to-day -day flow of an ever-changing emergency department. If this ballot question goes through, Massachusetts will be, will be required to hire 5,000 more nurses by January 1st. There's currently a shortage of 1,200 nurses in the state of Massachusetts. This is an unattainable task. Because the ratios in the ballot question one are so rigid, ultimately hospitals will be forced to close beds. What could this mean to Cooley Dickinson and the community that we serve? A 10% 10, a 10 decrease in medical surgical beds, a 20% decrease in the emergency departments that will be seen, which would be about 7,000 fewer patients served annually, a 25% reduction in the number of women who could give birth to at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, and a 25% decrease in mental health inpatient beds. Ultimately, 10,000 people in our community will be affected if by this limited access to care. California is not, has not produced any data supporting an improvement in the quality of care since adopting the nurse-patient ratios. Actually, Massachusetts currently outperforms California. Why would anyone model an initiative at the state whose health care system is inferior? Ms. McEwen, could you maybe one more sentence to one wrap more up? Sentence. Sure. Cooley Dickinson's mission is to serve our patients and our communities with exceptional, compassionate, and personalized care. Please vote no on question one and allow us to preserve our mission and provide care to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person is uh, Martha Nathan. Boy, this is difficult. Um, I expected to speak about one thing, but I think I'm going to have to start up with, off with another. I'm 24 Massasoit Street in Northampton, and I would just like to say that the amount of confusion sown by corporate medicine around the issue of number one is pretty appalling. And uh, 
my best analogy is one that, as I was canvassing on this issue, uh, was given to me by a teacher who said this initiative, ballot initiative number one, is like making sure that as a teacher, I do not have to teach 40 kids a, a day. Um, there have to be limits to what professionals can do, the kind of services they can give. And I hope that people reconsider, uh, people consider the true facts on this issue. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to thank you guys. Uh, I, I hate using guys, that, that just pops out of it. You men and women are city councilors who are really stellar and um, did a wonderful piece of work two weeks ago in the first re uh, reading of the resolution um, to stop gas, unneeded gas infrastructure and specifically the company pipeline, Columbia Pipeline Expansion. Um, right after you passed that unanimously, the IPCC, as you know, came out with its report saying that we have 12 years to cut emissions by 45 percent. Mm -hmm. We cannot build more pipelines, and you have said as much, and we will continue to travel down that road, I know, towards cutting emissions so that we can save a world that is far too beautiful and far too precious for us. The Mer Merrimack Valley explosions told us the story of the immediate dangers of gas and the chronic emissions that cause asthma and COPD um, are the constant reminders of the health impacts of uh, burning of fossil fuels. I thank you very much. I hope you pass it again on second reading tonight unanimously. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, the next person is Joe Twarog. Can I have for 36 seconds? <laughs> All right, sorry, Joe. <laughs> so I'm Joe Twarog, 21 Longfellow Drive. I'm here to talk about question one from a personal um, point of view. My mother, about a few years ago, was in the ER here at Cooley Dickinson. I see these ads about holding the wall. It's all garbage, because what happened to her is disgraceful and cruel. She has put in a uh, holding area in the hallway. They have institu institutionalized this, saying holding area three. I stood there with her for hours and hours and hours before she could be admitted upstairs because there was no staff. There was no staff. Finally, they shipped her into a, a holding area, a, another holding area, like a closet, and they call it fast track. There was no bathroom, no food, no place to sit. It was outrageous. It was for out. I'm sorry I'm so agitated, but it's outrageous. That's the reality. So when I see ads that the opposition is putting out the holding line, it's happening now. So the question I have is how can more staff be bad for patient care? Keep that thought in mind. How can that be bad? Mm -hmm. So the other thing is <clears throat> that they say the letter in today's paper, well, they have to choose between that or a $25,000 fine. That's garbage. The fine is zero dollars to 25,000 and it's reviewable, it's appealable, it's not immediate, period. The uh, Health Policy Commission came out with an estimate uh, last week it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars. Uh, this was primarily through hospital um, researchers that put that together. They cost out a nurse at $300,000. Hello, nobody, show me that nurse. <laughs> And they're also saying that the average wage increase would be four to six percent. I negotiate contracts for 40 years. If that hasn't happened in probably two decades, it's garbage. Those are lies. Um, the um, the uh, the opposition is spending 27 million plus uh, of fighting this. We don't have that money to challenge that, but we do have feet on the ground and we have truth on our side because there's lies, there's deception, there's intentional mis, uh, misrepresentation of the fact. And what's worse is they're scare tactics. They're scaring seniors, um, people who claim to be progressive and are speaking for Kulidic are saying it's gonna take nurses out of these settings. That's garbage, it's very upsetting. Uh, and they're sending, by the way, money to the Cayman Islands. These hospitals are sending money to the Cayman, that's our money, that's our money. That's taxpayer money. What's it doing there? Um, 
And finally, the date of implementation. That is simply inaccurate. Look at the pot law. How many years does it take to implement that? That's, that's simply saying that that's when it takes effect and there'll be two years before they have uh, reviews on the acuity standards and whatnot. The, the bill passed on one-to-one -one in the ICUs. There was, the, the hospitals challenged what a, what a emergency was. It went on for a year and a half before that was implemented. So it's patently unfair. Um, so, Mr. Tuarag, your time has expired. Okay, it's shameful and disgraceful what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, the next is Alex Jarrett. Uh, Alex Jarrett, 8 Pine Street, Florence. Um, first, want to speak just in support of the resolution on, on the moratorium on additional gas pipelines. Um, I applaud the council on taking the stand here. Um, I wanted to talk about Northampton Housing Authority and Councillor O'Donnell's proposal um, to add seats, tenant seats to the board. Um, and I'm definitely in favor of this proposal. Um, I come from a worker cooperative and housing cooperative background. And um, so those organizations are democratically run organizations that um, we're all, where the stakeholders are given a place at the table. And what I think is what, you know, Councilor O'Donnell is trying to do is to uh, make the, have, you know, the people who live there, the people who have a stake in the, in a large stake in living there, um, to give them a place at the table and to make it a more de democratically run uh, organization. Um, I know from being part of a worker cooperative that it, the, it's critical to have that sense of ownership, um, and that having having seats on the board, you know, can give gives the tenants that sense of ownership um, rather than just a sense of helplessness. Um, there are a couple in my history. There's a couple of ways to build that culture of cooperation, um, and. One is to bring in a uh, to bring in a few people at a time to an already functioning um, sent, you know, board that, that functions cooperatively, um, and the other is to have a strong program of education. So I think being raised in this culture, um, a co competitiveness and having the personal success be uh, rated higher than. Um, group success is kind of a, a, a ideal that a lot of us have internalized. And um, that instead of, um, and so instead we want to create a culture of cooperation where that um, people can feel that this, the, um, where group success is more important and education around how to function cooperatively um, is important. So I urge that you build into that structure that as new tenant um, board members come on, that there's you know, a lot of education around all of the issues for the success. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Um, the next is Pam Hanna. Hi, my name is Pam Hanna. Um, I prefer they and them pronouns. I live at 11 Church Street in Northampton. And um, I'm just going to do a little touch on a bunch of things. Uh, so I understand there's a resolution coming tonight for you all to support Yes on 3. Um, and I hope that, um, that all of you uh, take that on and uh, support Yes on 3. I didn't come with notes, I should um, So I'll just talk a little bit about Yes on 3. So one of the things is what I see the real, the real purpose of the no on three folks. And again, that is to, um, the, uh, the yes on three is to maintain the law that protects transgender people uh, in public spaces. Um, the no on three people, um, their goal is to keep trans folks out of public spaces. Um, they're framing it, uh, they're using fear tactics which get used all over the place. Right, the hospital administrators are using fear tactics about hospitals needing to close when really if we uh, you know, redistributed the CEO pay 
um, or if we took the 27 million that they're using for the uh, no on one campaign and actually put that into the public sphere and put that into healthcare and single payer, et cetera, we wouldn't, you all have such blind faces, I get it. I was, a, I was a school committee member. Anyway, so the fear tactic for, um, the fear tactic for um, question three is saying that if this law stays in effect, that we are putting uh, women and girls um, in danger in bathrooms, in public bathrooms. Um, which, first of all, there's been no increase in crime, uh, and second of all, there is no uh, trans get out of jail card, um, get out of jail free card, by just by saying I'm a trans person, um, I didn't mean, or I did mean to assault you, but I'm a trans person and I shouldn't be held accountable for that. Um, that's not true. We know that in Northampton, uh, there was a non-trans janitor uh, who was uh, taking pictures uh, in the high school locker room, in the girls' locker room. Um, and so um, this, it's a fear tactic, um, and um, the people really who are vulnerable are, are trying to be kept out of public spaces. I do want to uh, comment on, on the fear tactic that's being used because I do wish there was a greater focus on protecting women and girls and men and boys and people outside the gender binary from sexual assault. And the, one of the first places that I'd like to see that addressed, publicly addressed, publicly acknowledged, is the sexual assault that happened in our own state house. That happened um, with the collusion of our former state senator. I'd like that to be named. I'd like those survivors to be believed. I'd like for us to hold our friends as accountable as we hold some stranger accountable, the way that we all came out about Brett Kavanaugh. If we can't hold our friends accountable and encourage them to speak out and believe survivors, we're really screwed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, now we go to Patty Healy. Dickinson, actually, it was a student at UMass. Um, I'm here to speak in support of question one because I think it's really important for all of my city councilors to hear from us. Um, really, you're hearing from everybody outside of um, this room. But, uh, but the first thing I wanted to do is because every um, place I've been where um, a nursing executive has reported that there are no studies in California <coughs> that uh, support or have shown that there have been better outcomes um, in California. In fact, there were eight studies. I have the abstracts in my hand, and I would like to share them with you. You don't have to take them, but I, would, I beg that you look at them because there are studies. Um, and I have read all 80 studies that have indicated that there are better outcomes when you're better staffing um, in hospitals, bedside, um, bedside uh, care. Um, but. As a nurse, you know, I've been dealing this, with this for 40 years, and my family has also been, a, they've been patients at both Bay State and Cooley Dickinson. They've been in the emergency room, they've been in the ICU, and I can say, because from an educated point of view as a nurse, I had to stay overnight with my parents and with my daughter because there weren't enough nurses at Cooley Dickinson or Bay State to care for them safely. And they admitted that to me, that they did not have the time to care for my, my loved ones. Nurse to nurse, I did hear that. Um, executives, the hospital industry has failed to address this. This has been an issue for my entire professional life. Uh, we have been, um, had our unions work on it. We've had multiple strikes in this state. We have every single strike in this state has addressed staffing. It wasn't about money. So I just want to remind you, we have not been able to change the staffing in Massachusetts hospitals using our best, strongest effort. Um, and I wanted to address the emergency room wait times. Massachusetts has the 48th worst longest wait times of the 50 states. And that is a fact. We do not, so we have a, a long way to go to make it better. In California, in the emergency room, three years after implementing the, the ratios there, their emergency room wait times reduced by 47% of time per patient. So those outcomes did change, and they're in many, many studies. Uh, last of all, I just wanted to address um, the fact that this is only a union issue. In fact, 70% of Massachusetts hospitals have um, M&A nurses there. 
So most bedside nurses in the state, yes, are part of m &A and have funded this out of pocket. My union dues have paid for this. It's not the hospital in industry spending thousands and millions of dollars, tax dollars, Medicare dollars, Medicaid dollars, spending our money from our hospitals on fighting the very people who work in the hospitals and deliver that care. Mm -hmm. Women have been doing this work for eons. And this is also a fight for women workers because this industry wouldn't be able to get away with this for so long if this was a group of workers who were men. And I, Thank I you, really believe that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oh, yes, I'm one. Um, before we continue, I'd like to request that um, comments from the audience be addressed to uh, myself and the council rather than other members of the audience. That just keeps things flowing uh, better. Uh, the next person, um, his first name is Aaron. You have to forgive me, I can't read the last name, but you can tell us and yes. your name and address. Uh, I'm Aaron Bazoulis. I live at 131 State Street. Um, I'm also a professor at Western New England Law School um, in Springfield. Um, I teach and research about civil rights and particularly sex and gender discrimination. So I'm here in that capacity to speak in favor of your resolution uh, reaffirming our public accommodations law prohibiting uh, discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Uh, and I won't reiterate my neighbor's fine comments. I just want to add a little bit of historical context to that. Uh, our public accommodations law in Massachusetts predates its federal counterpart by a century. It was in the wake of the Civil War that we passed uh, a statute that recognized that uh, discrimination on the basis of race was a, a barrier to the full inclusion in public life. Uh, and so we passed a statute to address that. Um, eventually, the, um, the, the United States, the federal government, followed suit, not until the 19th. But in the meanwhile, Massachusetts was busy expanding and adding protected categories uh, to our earlier law. We added protection for discrimination based on religion and national origin by the 1950s. In the 1970s, we added protection on the basis of sex and disability. In 1989, we added protection on the basis of sexual orientation. And in 2016, we added protection against discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Every time our legislature did that, they did it in response to evidence that that protection was needed. Now we're faced with a ballot question that threatens to repeal the earlier added protections on the basis of gender identity. The very fact that we have that ballot question is proof that that protection is needed in our state law. Um, moreover, I want to talk about the fact that the injury that discrimination um, causes is not just the physical act of exclusion. It is a dignitary injury that occurs at the same time. And for that reason, I think it's critically important that municipalities like ours pass resolutions like the one that you're considering tonight, because if anything can serve as at least a partial antidote to that dignitary injury, it's knowing that our community stands up in favor of equality and against discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Kevin Lake, please. Thank you. Kevin Lake, Washington Avenue, 35 Washington Avenue. We, this is a question one. We as progressive often develop habits of thought that incline us to uh, take shortcuts and assume, for instance, very often, that within hierarchies, uh, uh, there's a structure that's almost inherently exploited. And therefore, uh, that there are people who are being exploited and people who are doing the exploiting. I think it's important to recognize what the governance structure of community hospitals actually is. Community hospitals are governed by volunteer boards made up of citizens. For the last nine years, I've been a volunteer in this capacity with the Dickinson Health Care. We trustees legally have a duty of care for the capital D, uh, capital C. We also have a duty of loyalty. We, we literally have to care and uh, pay attention and be prudent. We have a duty of loyalty to the social mission of the organization. We hire managers that we believe will fulfill our mission and live up to our values. We spend several hours a week. I've been on several boards. I've never spent as much time as I have on the Cooley board. I've been on nine committees. Um, we walk the floors. We talk to staff. We're very concerned with creating an institution 
uh, that will, where people will be proud to work and glad to work and be able to deliver excellent care and feel uh, like their mission personally matches that of the organization. Bad morale, nurse burnout, unsafe patient loads are all evidence of dysfunction and evidence of poor management. In recent years, we had a different administration when I first joined. In recent years, we have put in place a management team uh, that are committed to and determined to build this as a place where people are an envi work environment, where people are glad to work and deliver excellent care. And we work with them every day, uh, typically the trustees, uh, to make sure that that's happened. And we are also um, uh, aware that we've chosen people who even if we weren't watching so closely would do that because wouldn't you, if you were in that role, if you had responsibility for the healthcare system? The MA website describes this problem as greedy, quote, greedy CEOs maximizing their profits at the expense of bedside nurses. This is just insulting to people who have dedicated their lives to trying to get it right. And it's insulting to those of us who are citizens trying to volunteer to make sure that we get it right. I'm a former union guy, I've been a member of two unions. I believe unions are central and important in our society. But make your case, don't make stuff up. This is uh, a lot of what people have been saying is in fact been disproved by an independent watchdog uh, organization, the Mass Health Policy Commission. A lot of what has been worried about is in fact, I'm on the budget committee, I'm on a number of committees, there are real problems. Mr. Lake? We, oh. uh, it's important to learn enough to think it through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the people I have signed up. Is there anyone else who has not signed up but would like to provide public comment? So we'll go you, sir, and then, and then we'll go behind you. And then we'll go to Sharon. Good evening. My name is Dave Reutman. I live at 575 Bridge Road. I strongly support the comments of the folks who spoke in, in favor of yes on one and three. But uh, I really want to express first thanks for your action on the gas infrastructure resolution. And the perspective I'm bringing in my comments right now is that I, 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 my career was as a psychologist. And I'm very aware of our human tendency um, to allow our focus uh, to, to follow the uh, moving target, so to speak. Uh, my gratitude to you for your action, not only on, on uh, the infrastructure uh, resolution, but on other resolutions that you've supported uh, to uh, help us um, deal with climate change comes from my perspective that we will be spending, in fact, we're already spending um, so much. It's going to be, if you read the IPCC report, um, you know how carefully that was put together, how well researched. We're talking about 50 plus trillion dollars. Where is the money going to come from to deal with all the rest of our challenges unless we deal with climate change first and foremost. So I know I'm preaching the choir on this, but I just want to offer that perspective in terms of the dollars and in terms of the lives. We're already seeing so many lives so tragically disrupted, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse very rapidly. So that's another perspective that I'm bringing. And my final point is that um, People who are very close to me, who are uh, paying attention to this issue, are feeling real despair, um, paralyzing despair. And um, I'm so grateful to you for taking the action that you have. And I know that you will continue to take these actions, because by doing so, you are really providing some hope for people who really need to be taking action and can be taking action, but are paralyzed because of this despair. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for those comments. Um, so the gentleman who's right behind you, who I believe raised his hand. Yes, sir. 
What's yours? Good evening, everyone. My name is Manny Pintaro. I'm at uh, Wedding Hansen Court. I have the army on uh, apartment file three. If you are not, he knows me here. Thank you. Uh, I was not planning to talk, eh, to say anything today. I, I just came over here to support the resolution. But the fact is, of the matter, is that I, I agree with everything I've been said. And just one more thing. Mark Curry, who is the president of Bob State Health, all he does is abuse the time. And I was in many, many of the rallies and demonstrations with the nurses at Bay State, frankly. I even went I, I, I even went all the way to the brochures. And one thing is true. A lot of the nurses are being abused on the time. One case that came to my mind was one of the nurses told me that one time she was there for 16 hours with no relief on site. 16 hours, think about this. And now everybody's trying to get question uh, for everyone to say um, both no on question one. How would you feel? I mean, just think about this. You have some kind of bad accident, you know, and you're in the IC unit, and you have a nurse who hasn't had a break for 16 hours for her to take care of you, I will not feel very safe about it. That's what we definitely have to vote yes on question one. We have to vote yes and say no to Carrick, no to all these people who are in the big pharma and all these um, bureaucrats that all they want is to abuse the nurses and want to tell the people we are going to make the decisions for you. So I'm glad that question one is being uh, thought about it. And thank you for the resolution for question three. Both yes on question one, both yes on question three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think um, Ms. Moulton, are you next? I'm Sharon Moulton. I'm from 48 Evergreen Road in um, Leeds in District Ward 7B. And I just want to personally say thank you. Um, I, along with what David said, that it's really important to me that the city that I live in is standing up in recognition of the climate emergency that we're in and the thing that, and that we need to take bold stances in action right now because I'm one of the people who can get extremely depressed. Um, so I thank you very much for that. And when I heard about the resolution in support of yes on three, I was very grateful because I knew there'd be people here speaking and there are people listening on TV and it's really important to hear the support for that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Eric. Quick, quick one. Sure. Uh, yes. um, whoops. Um, yeah, newsflash. Uh, this is kind of weak. It came up last week. Everybody's recycling. There are the pedal people here, uh, evidently in the valley, recycling every day, getting paid minimum wage to do the usual dump truck, trash run. Demolition or the they were all five nine six um, down the hall on the town lawn town line and uh, the message is kind of weak. My I lost my pencil sharpener, which was gold Alberto. So I'm whittling with my Smith and Wesson and it's tending to, to fly. Splintering. So um, maybe Arizona could be recycled by Nike, because they would probably just put their stamp on it. Just do it. I mean everybody's familiar. So I did receive uh, information or a note from uh, Elizabeth Warren staff, general about the environment. A little pasty, we're all familiar. Um, somehow we'll just start recycling Arizona. I believe, or right through to totally in Rhode Island, or Ralph Nader. All right, thanks, Daniel. Okay. Good day. Thank you. Um, let's see, so who else we have? Yes, sir, you in the back? Come, come right up. This is Anthony Malpinkalo, uh, Botanis, Burkina Mistu Botanis. I'm pointing chief of the Sixika Nation of Southern Alberta, Canada. And the indigenous people in Western Massachusetts uh, were part of the fight in Sandusfield Otis State Forest to defend sacred stones 
against the um, the Tennessee uh, subsidiary of Kinder Morgan to um, defend the sacred stone that, it, that existed there in that uh, old growth forest. And we were there to pray over the stones and we were there to uh, make a stand and uh, put our bodies on the line to defend that old growth forest. We were not successful against the uh, pipeline company that put the pipeline under the, the watershed that existed there. In fact, they drained over 100,000 gallons of that water to flush the pipe that they built. So this, uh, the pipeline company used Massachusetts State Court System to go around Article 97 of the Massachusetts State Constitution that protected old growth forest watersheds for the benefit of Massachusetts State residents. And the arm of that pipeline is scheduled to be built through West Springfield to service Holyoke to service this uh, area. And so we just want to affirm that there are other ways to uh, address this climate cr catastrophe, this climate crisis that we're all facing. And so I just wanted to step forward and make a, uh, be the voice of some of the indigenous people in Western Massachusetts in the Pioneer Valley uh, in, the, in this area to uh, praise and uh, thank you guys for bringing this to, to the attention and take a stand because people notice what Northampton does and a positive move towards addressing this on the city level and making a statement is, is very powerful. So I thank you for that and thank you. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. Anyone else like to give public comment at this time? Okay. Hearing none, we will convene. I'll ask the roll of the council. Sure. 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 Here. President. Here. President. Here. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. And Councilor Shara. Here. All right. We are convened and ready to go. The first is a public hearing. This is an announcement of a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2019 tax levy. The North Anne City Council will hold a hearing on Thursday, November 1st, 2018 at 7.05 here in the City Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, Mass., to discuss the percentages of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property within the City of Northampton for fiscal year FY19. In accordance with Chapter 40, Section 56 of the Mass General Laws, uh, information about this issue will be available for public inspection in the City Clerk's Office on or before October 30th, uh, 2018, after, after 12 p.m. Very exact time. Um, let's see, a uh, quick update from me. You've heard this before. This is an announcement regarding executive session uh, minutes. You'll meeting law requires public bodies to regularly review minutes of executive sessions to determine if they may be disclosed. It's been determined that because of pending litigation, the purpose of the November 16, 2017 executive session has not yet been served, uh, and so continued non-disclosure is warranted. Are there other announcements from committee chairs or other councils? Councilor Chair. Um, yes, on the agenda, there is an announcement of public forums that are being held by the Committee on Community Resources in conjunction with the Committee on legislative matters and these forums are uh, to get public opinion on a proposal that's before the council to seek state legislation to increase the tenant membership of the Northampton Housing Authority. Um, it, the, the proposal um, set, uh, requests that um, the state legislature uh, consider having um, tenant members be on the Housing Authority and that they would be voted by um, the those also that live in the buildings that are um, owned and operated by the Housing Authority. So those forums, the first one is Wednesday, October 24th, that's next Wednesday, it's at JFK Middle School in the community room, that's from 7 to 8.30. And then there will be one on Tuesday, November 13th, right here in the Council Chambers from 7 to 8.30. Um, the sponsor, who's Councilor O'Donnell, um, will present the, the proposal and then we'll open it up for public comment. Um, and if anyone would like to submit written comments, um, if they can't come, they can email them to Laura, who is our administrative assistant, and her email is lkrutzler at northamptonma.gov. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank the chair and then the committee for its work in organizing those important forums. Thank you. So, Councilor Carney. You said the one minute announcements? Yep. Here, okay. Um, so, uh, in on uh, October 30th, that's a week from uh, next Tuesday, here in council chambers, there will be a meeting, a, a um, meeting to <clears throat> follow up um, from the uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation's 25% uh, hearing that was held a few weeks ago regarding the King Street uh, reconstruction. And specifically, this meeting will address issues around the uh, proposed um, improvements to the intersection at Finn Street and State Street. So for those who um, were unable to come on um, September, I forget what the date was there, a few weeks ago when MassDOT had its hearing, um, we will have more information uh, regarding that proposal and where it stands and um, uh, allow for people to ask questions and, be, and have qu uh, questions answered um, by the DPW who will be there and also the project engineer for the MassDOT project. Could you repeat that time? Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It is October 30th, Tuesday at 5.30 here in Council Chambers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Councilor Bidwell. Uh, yes. This coming weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the 19th to 21st, is the Northampton Jazz Festival, which is returning to Northampton after a, after a several years hiatus. Um, it's great to have this uh, celebration of local jazz musicians and nationally significant musicians coming to town. There's a, uh, appearances in venues all over town Friday night and Saturday afternoon. There's a big concert at the Academy Saturday night and there's a jazz brunch on Sunday that's a fundraiser actually to benefit jazz in the schools, a new program to promote jazz education, jazz music in our Northampton public schools. So. I would encourage folks to attend as much of that as possible. Great, thank you. Others, Councillor uh, Klein. On um, Tuesday, October 30th, um, there will be a meeting that is uh, sponsored by the planning department here in Northampton, planning the future of Florence Center, a community meeting. Um, it's for people to come and talk about what they envision for the center of Florence. Um, Tuesday, October 30th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Florence Civic Center. Thank you very much. Any other one-minute announcements? Council of Barge. Yes. Um, <clears throat> October 31st is the um, Halloween parade in the center of Florence, and also judging of costumes is at 5.30 p.m. Um, across from Roger's Bicycle Shop in the park. So hopefully we'll see everybody dressed up. Are you ready to reveal your Halloween costume, yeah. Councilor Barge? Uh -huh. Are you ready to tell us tonight what it is? Thank you. Oh, nice. <laughs> Perfect. You asked. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone beat that? <laughs> Councilor Klein. I can't beat that. That's not why I'm raising my hand. <laughs> See what you got. Go ahead. <coughs> um, something else from the uh, Department of Planning and Sustainability, the Northampton Climate Resiliency and Regeneration Plan um, Climate Action Workshop will be on Tuesday, October 23rd from 5.30 to 7.30 at First Churches in Lyman Hall. Um, the city is currently studying the sources of our community's greenhouse gas emissions and it's an opportunity for the public to talk about how we see reduction in greenhouse gas, em greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and let's see what else I can tell you about it, though, just so you know what you're coming to. Um, yeah, it's also a fun event, and there are going to be prizes, and I'm not quite sure what that means. But <laughs> And Tuesday, October 23rd, 530 to 730 in Lyman Hall at First Churches. There'll Thank be you. costumes? <laughs> okay. Costumes. Betty Boop might make an appearance. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. I Dress up as a pipeline. That would be really <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Sounds shy. like there are no other one-minute announcements, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have any communications? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So let's see. We have the second reading of 18170, resolution opposing the expansion of gas infrastructure. 
and calling for increased development and implementation of renewable and clean energy sources. I assume we want to waive reading on this since we read it last time. Is that correct? Hearing no objection, is there a motion to approve it on second reading? Motion approved. Made by Councillor Bard, seconded by Councillor Klein. Discussion on second reading. Councillor Bidwell. Um, uh, Councillor Bidwell is actually, as you recall, it offered a few amendments and some modifications, and we were <laughs> we were exchanging emails. There, there was. He has a lot of information at his hands, and unfortunately, he, saw, he released some information that really didn't apply. <laughs> so, so uh, this is by way of introduction to to <laughs> Council Bidwell, given an opportunity to to expand on what what we have actually some proposed modifications in here. But I I, I defer to Council Bidwell to yeah. to, to speak to that point. Wow, how about that I, was just I, an introduction. I think okay. what Councilor Dwight is trying to say is I sent the wrong attachment in an email to him. I was trying to give you some comfort. Uh, no, <laughs> I, and as Councilor Klein realized, okay. too, I, I sent an attachment that was amendments to a resolution on gas pipelines from a year ago. Nonetheless, the, the two very simple things that we talked about in principle here, and I said I would write up and send on, had to do with the third whereas and the sixth whereas. And there have been adequate modifications made to the sixth, whereas the, the point of this was we, we talked about it was a little much to say that all of this uh, attention to energy retrofits and solar energy regeneration and air source heat pumps was a direct consequence of the moratorium. Language has been changed to uh, essentially say that those things were underway anyway, and the moratorium probably gave it a boost. So I'm quite comfortable with the uh, uh, amended language there. Uh, Councilor, would you like to read your amendments as you go, or do you well, kind of want to discuss Well, actually, the, what I had suggested is yeah. now reflected in a slightly revised language from two weeks ago. So, so, so we sort of adopted it's what? So it, it uh, I don't know how you had intended it, Councilor Dwight. Well, there's, there is an amended, proposed amended version that, that um, is it? submitted that you will find it should be in your packet. So we passed something two weeks ago, Right. I recall. Which of them reflects that? I because we also amended it two weeks ago, so I sort of assumed that the amendments were our amendments from two weeks ago. Those amendments are in here. Okay. The ones that we passed, but we did amend one whereas in response to Councillor Bidwell's okay. um, concern, and we agreed with him. Um, so I'll just read it really quickly. Okay. It says, whereas in response to Columbia Gas's longstanding moratorium on new gas service installations, Northampton and surrounding communities have aggressively pursued green energy modalities, including energy retrofits, solar energy generation, air sourced heat pumps, and methane <clears throat> capture, the use of which has reduced our dependency on natural gas while conforming to the goal of using only 100% renewable alternatives to provide our energy. Um, so what we're saying essentially is exactly what Councillor Bidwell brought to our attention that, and that he just mentioned now, is that it's, it wasn't um, just in response to Columbia Gas's moratorium. We were already pursuing these things aggressively, um, but as Councillor Bidwell said, we gave it a boost. It gave it a boost um, to have the moratorium put into place. Okay, so do we need an amendment tonight? Or did we do this already? I'm, I'm confused. That is a proposed amendment. That's, that's you just read an amendment that you would like to ch switch out one for the other. Thank okay. you. Do I hear a second on that amendment? Yes, you do. Um, can we do it one by one, or do you want to continue? Are sure, let's just do that, but let's okay. do that one. Okay, any discussion on the amendment read by the Council for Ward 7, proposed by Council for Ward 2? Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that is approved. Do you have further ones? Uh, yes, this this one is is not reflected in in the revised draft. It w was to have been, but this was the the wrong document that I sent along. Uh, the the third whereas, and I'll read it as it stands now, and as I would suggest a, f a very minor change. In its June fourth two thousand fifteen resolution calling for transparency and public representation regarding natural gas infrastructure. The Northampton City Council cited data that suggests that repairing existing pipeline will eliminate the need for the installation of any new pipeline infrastructure and calls on gas companies not to build new pipeline, etc. The slight change that I 
uh, had referred to when we met two weeks ago and that I um, would suggest here comes from the fact that I went back and looked at that resolution and it, it, there really, the, uh, the resolution was aspirational Screen. and hoping that that might happen, but there was, there, at the time, was no data. In fact, we're looking for data from Columbia Gas that would support this assertion. So if we're going to base one resolution on another resolution, I'm just suggesting we be accurate about our reference to the resolution, and I think it would be more accurate to say the Northampton City Council asserted that repairing existing pipeline might eliminate the need for the installation of any new pipeline infrastructure. I would suggest, I would offer that as an amendment um, since we didn't, uh, we don't really have data to support that. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll second, second it for motion. purposes of discussion. And second it. Councilor Klein, you. So that resolution um, in 2015, we actually did cite data. We cited two pieces of data. Um, one was um, Senator Markey's report, and the other one I'm blanking out on what it was. I would have to pull up the resolution. Probably, I would bet that Councilor Bidwell has it. Do you have it right in front of you? But anyway, those two reports, we did cite those two reports and we footnoted the reports and they um, did both say that it's likely that with repairs to pipe, the pipeline, we would have adequate gas without building additional infrastructure. So that was in that resolution. That's a piece that I wrote in that resolution that I researched and included footnotes on. So are you directing your question to Councilor Bidwell? No, this is in um, 2015. It was Markey's in a Harvard report or something. I'll, I can pull it up if we have a question about it. I, I, I would just add that I, I don't have terribly strong feelings about this. I didn't, I didn't see any footnoted references, and uh, my impression was that at the time we h hoped that plugging of gas pipelines might provide sufficient capacity to make up for other needs, but I was not aware, and I didn't see the specific reference in the, in the resolution to that, so I was just suggesting that we frame it as affirma affirmational as opposed to citing so categorically that it was the case. But if my colleagues would rather keep it in its original language, as I say, this is, since I totally agree with where the resolution winds up as, I'm not going to quibble further about um, the, a few sentences in the third whereas. So if, if so the, the original sponsors are uncomfortable with the suggested change, I would be glad to withdraw my amendment. Councillor Klein, do you want to? Yeah, so um, we have whereas a 2000, this is from 2015, this was the amendment, and maybe you weren't looking at the amended version of that resolution in 2015, because this was an amendment that was um, approved and added into the resolution. Whereas a 2013 research report released by the office of Senator Edward Markey documents that between 2000 and 2011, by not replacing leaking natural gas pipelines, gas companies have passed on to Massachusetts ratepayers between this much and this much. Um, unaccounted gas that never reached their homes, businesses, and municipalities, and that this leaked gas has contributed irreparably to the degradation of the public's health. Um, whereas according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 2011, leaks in other processes of the natural gas distribution system were the largest source of, source of methane issues, blah, 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 sorry. Um, whereas this accounted for gas if captured through repair and upgrade of the current pipeline infrastructure could likely meet a significant portion if not all of our energy needs and allow for new hookups. So that's a whereas that came directly out of s those two particular reports. Um, and Edward, Senator Edward Markey's and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's 2011 report. So that, that's where that came from. Okay, so with, with, uh, relative to the amendment on the floor, we can either have it withdrawn, we can continue to debate it, we can vote on it, um, but I uh, leave it up to the maker of the motion I am, I am glad to withdraw my, my motion to amend. Okay. Uh, so that motion is withdrawn. We're back to the regular order. Uh, any further discussion or amendments to the resolution? No? Oh, excuse me. A couple of no, Scrivener's oh. things that were caught last time are now in here. The Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission as opposed to Sustainability and Energy 
as you'll see, and um, we fixed at the very end the name of the, um, the group that the Northampton activists that we were working with are from, succeeding without additional pipeline swap is now in the resolution. So I think that's it. Was there anything else? That was, uh, those were the points as I understood them when they were iterated, so. Okay. And so, is that a motion? To, that needs to be changed now? For the Scribner's Scribner's that was changed. changed. <laughs> 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 the Scribner's 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 Scribner's
in places of public accommodation. Be it further resolved that the Administrative Assistant of the City Council shall cause a copy of this res resolution to be sent to the Yes on 3 Freedom for All Massachusetts campaign, uh, to the No on 3 campaign, and to Governor Charles Baker. So I would accept the motion to approve so this resolution. Moved. Made by Councilor Dwight and seconded by Councilor LaBarge. Um, could I ask the Councilor from Ward 4 to start? Um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank my constituent, Claire Lobdell, who approached me and asked if the council was going to address question three. Um, I appreciate her advocacy and that of many here in our city, including uh, people that were from her tonight. Um, I also appreciate my co-sponsor, Councillor Klein, for her work on this. And I'm confident that any of our colleagues uh, would have been very happy to sign on. Um, and I appreciate the support that I've seen from other councillors on this issue. Um, to the substance, I really don't have much to say, except that this is disgraceful that this is on the ballot and that we really even need to address it at all. Um, the repeal of a basic fundamental right is discrimination simple as that. Uh, rolling back these protections from discrimination in a public place is wrong. It's cruel and it's backwards. And it would be shameful, um, in addition to leading on this issue, it would be shameful to be the first state to roll back um, these provisions and, uh, and take away something so basic. Um, so I ask everyone to vote yes on question three on November 6th. A yes vote is saying that yes, of course, we want to keep these basic fundamental protections that are already in place, that people can use public accommodations according to their gender identity. Everyone's entitled to use public space. That's what public means. Um, the opponents of the standing law, in addition to feeling emboldened by the current culture in the White House, are betting that enough people will be confused by this ballot initiative or that they just dislike ballot initiatives and, uh, as a concept and tend to vote no on them. Um, I think it's disingen disingenuous and it's sneaky and there's really nothing that makes me more angry than nasty attempts to confuse voters, um, except blatant bigotry, so this one's a twofer for me. And so I just appreciate that uh, everyone's support tonight on this resolution, and I ask that you all vote yes on November 6th. Thank you. Uh, Council DeBarge. Yes, um, I'm very upset that question three is even on the ballot. It is very upset, upsetting that another resolution Northampton and mass discrimination laws prohibiting discrimination in places of public accommodation on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. I really feel that people are confused with this ballot question. As a city council, I've had several people ask me, what is this question three? And when I tell them what it is, they're like, why is it there? So I agree with you. I am, as a city councilor, asking all voters in Ward 6 and in the city to please vote yes on number three. Freedom for all Massachusetts to keep the basic protection people already have. Diversity is beautiful and is even more strong. Thank you very much. Other comments from members of the council? Oh. Councilor Carr. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilors Klein and Shara, for introducing this resolution, which is really important. Um, in my day job, I work for the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, and I wanted to note that um, on September 25th, the Mass AFL-CIO officially uh, joined um, 15 other major local, the AFL-CIO is the umbrella organization, but we joined 15 large uh, other unions uh, representing hundreds of thousands of Massachusetts workers and signing on and endorsing the Yes on Three uh, campaign. And um, I'll just briefly uh, read from the President, Steve Tolman, who says, we're proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with our transgender friends, neighbors, and fellow union members in voting Yes on Three on Election Day. As a labor union, nothing is more important to us than the civil rights of our members and everyone across the nation. We know this law ensures that all people, including those who are transgender, can go about their living, mm -hmm. their everyday lives, free from discrimination and harassment. We strongly encourage voters to vote yes on three. So I just wanted to point that out and encourage people to vote yes on three. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Clay. I guess I'll just share very briefly, kind of as follow-up to Councilor Carney's comments, um, that we have labor unions um, supporting Yes on Three, but there's a really interesting kind of spread of 
diverse uh, organizations that are um, have come out in support of Yes on Three, and um, some of them include the Massachusetts um, Chiefs of Police Association, mm -hmm. the Massachusetts Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. Every single championship New England sports team, such as the Red Sox, the Patriots, the Celtics, the Bruins, I don't even know what those teams are personally, but I know it's, I know it's important to some people. Uh, hundreds of faith leaders, bipartisan legislative leadership, many Massachusetts businesses, the, um, our Republican governor, and according to the Human Rights Campaign, nearly 70% of um, the country's leading Fortune 500 companies have non-discrimination policies in place that explicitly cover uh, gender identities. So the business community is also in support of this. Um, so it's, it's just interesting that uh, there is such broad um, support and I encourage everyone to vote yes on question three on November 6th. Thank you, Councilor Dwight. Um, now, of course, in the last couple of decades, actually, you know, for over well, a couple of generations, actually, we've been progressing slowly, um, painfully, towards advancing and expanding rights to everybody, to, to literally try to memorialize equity and fairness. And now we are in a time uh, that it's didn't just start with this administration, it started a little before, or actually there are groups in Bolden to work and strive towards reversing rights that have been achieved. We're going to literally, as Councilor Sherrill said, to go backwards. But it's, it's, it's rather terrifying because I believe, and I don't know this for sure, but I believe in our history, as rights have been achieved, they've been established and they are part of the bedrock. We don't go backwards. We don't go backwards. We don't do that. We still, have, we still have to go forward to, there are many other people who are still suffering um, either through institutionalized bias or um, implicit bias. And the fact that we are now talking about the prospect and the possibility of literally stripping away the rights of American <laughs> citizens and removing them and to take them away from the protections that, that, that they should, I mean, the fact that we have to get to the point where we actually have to say they are specifically identified as protected and entitled to all the rights that everyone else should enjoy. And now we're, there are people who are working very hard with a sense of purpose to try and strip individuals, fellow citizens of their, of their protections and rights. And it's, it's, it's really, it is, and, and, uh, and what we have, it's kind of frustrating, but what we have for our, what we have is this, this opportunity to scream as loudly as we can or as whereas -y as we can to say absolutely no, absolutely no. And, I, and I'm pretty confident in the prospects of this passing. Um, I'm pretty confident of its, its overwhelming support here in the community, and, but I, we need to yell at the people who do not support something like this as loudly as possible to say we are not taking this for granted, we are not going to sit still while you try to deny people the rights that they're supposedly entitled to under citizenship. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Um, I, I have very little to add except I think it's, it's an extremely important statement for the City Council to make, so I appreciate the sponsors bringing this forward. I hope and expect that we'll have a unanimous vote on this. I mean, we're very clear in what we have felt um, and believed as a city for a long time. And I think um, it's, it's very fundamental dignity and inequality and respect for all people. So that's the message that we're reaffirming tonight. And it's a very crucial time to, to send that message. So, so thank you. Um, I'll ask for roll call. <coughs> Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Uh, the resolution is approved uh, unanimously on first reading. Great. Thank you. Um, the consent agenda, uh, let me read it, it contains the following items. 
you want to remove one, let me know, and we'll vote on it separately. The minutes of October 4th, 2018. Um, appointments to various committees, which will be tantamount to referring them to city services, I believe, at this point. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Those are to the Planning Board, Terry Colhane, um, to the Transportation and Parking Commission, Adam Novit, and to the Trust Fund Committee, Jake Dissinger. Uh, so, a motion to approve the consent so motion. Made Second. and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that is approved. Uh, we come to 18187, the warrant for the 2018 state election. Let's see, it's, it's very long because it lists, I mean, basically what it's doing, it says order that meetings of the inhabitants qualified to vote in the city of Northampton will be held on Tuesday, the 6th day of November 2018, in, in various polling places. This is our order to have a state election. Um, it lists all the voting places for all uh, 14 precincts in the city. It lists the offices um, that will be um, on the ballot. Those are Senator and Congress, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Secretary of State, Treasurer, Auditor, Representative in Congress, um, Governor's Council, uh, State Senator, State Representative, District Attorney, Clerk of Courts, Register of Deeds, those two for, <coughs> for Hampshire County. And then it lists uh, four ballot measures. There are three state ballot measures, questions one, two, and three. Um, and um, you know, the, the first is about um, uh, staffing ratios that, that you heard about earlier. The first is about a commission to consider potential amendments to the U.S. Constitution <coughs> relative to corporate rights and campaign contributions. And the third, um, you just heard about the third, about protections for people and matters of public accommodation. There are two non-binding resolutions. Um, the first is, shall the state represented from this district be instructed to vote for legislation to create a single-payer health care system? The second non-binding question is, shall the state represented from this district be instructed to introduce and vote in favor of legislation adopting a system for all state and local primaries and elections in which voters rank candidates in order of preference? That's a ranked choice voting election reform. So. I don't know if there's any, I doubt there's any appetite for me to read all these in yeah. full, but that is what the, the ballot will be. Again, it's November 6th, Tuesday, November 6th. Um, so I'd ask for a motion to approve this okay. order. Second. Second. Made and seconded. Any other comments or discussion? Councilor Dwight? Uh, relative to polling places for individuals who have any questions, I refer them to the city clerk's office to right. try and find You can read it in this order, provided you know which precinct you are in. <laughs> And if you don't, contact uh, uh, Pam Powers in the city clerk's office to find out where your appropriate polling place is. That's right. And you can also go to the, online to the state site, the Secretary of State's office, type in your address and get your polling place that way as well. Um, okay. Well, good. So this is on the floor. Um, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor yes. Councilor yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay, that's suspend approved. the rule. Okay. Is there a second to suspend the rules to allow for second? second. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Um, we have to do this because we have to post the warrant by October 30th. Um, so all those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The rules Move are second reading. Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on second reading? Roll call, please. Uh, I know that was a, a quick barrage of motions, so whenever, <laughs> you're, whenever you're ready. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shell. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. And Councilor yes. Okay, so that's approved. And we recess for finance now, is that right? Yes, we do. Oh, thank you. Well, Laura, would you call the roll of finance, please? Yeah. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Your business is the approval of our minutes from October 4th. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Any <coughs> changes to the minutes as you've seen them? Then all in favor, please say aye. 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 And our next item is uh, the first quarter financial report from the finance director, Susan Wright. And Susan's here to uh, there's, bring us up to date on how we're doing at the end of the first quarter. Fund and expenditures for both as well. 
Um, so there's uh, really nothing uh, to highlight in the revenues other than that they are on track. A little higher than um, I'd anticipate at this point, and that's a good sign, some of the economic indicators. Um, but the revenues in the general fund are right where they should be, and if you look at the revenues for the enterprise funds, you can see that they're right on track to all four enterprise funds have between 24 and 29 percent of their revenues collected for the first three quarters. So we are in good position in terms of revenue, and in terms of expenditures, again, it's only been three months, um, but the expenditures in the general fund, um, I look at all of the salary accounts just to make sure that none are going you know, astray. Um, and everybody is either at or below where they should be and where they are below, it's because I know that there are some vacancies in those departments. Um, in terms of OM, looking at the percentage doesn't really help as much because some departments have expenses at the beginning of the fiscal year where they're paying out a lot of stuff might be um, memberships or um, big contracts that we're doing. So for the payroll side, the percentage is actually very useful. For the OM side of things, I just kind of know what's going on in the departments. And everybody is on track. Um, and the same with the enterprise funds. They are looking um, just as we would expect. So you know, probably in mid-year, I'll have a little bit more to tell you about the way things are going. But um, I will say that building permits are up. Um, and so that's a good thing too for new growth and uh, for revenue. So. Anyone have any questions for Susan on the numbers? Again, it's kind of early in the fiscal year, Council. True, it's early in the fiscal year, but I just wondered about the uh, the parking revenues, parking lot, parking garage, parking pass. We're all below the twenty-five percent mark. Is there anything to be? read into that at this point in the year? No, what I need to do is I need to move, once I once you set the tax rate, I will be realigning our revenues, because you don't vote the revenues, you just vote the expenditures. I'll be realigning the revenue in Munis to match what we need to do our budget. And what I need to do in the parking is, if you look at the lines for parking, before we went to the credit cards, we had four major categories. It was parking revenue, lot revenue, garage revenue, and pass revenue. If you look down below, you're going to also see parking kiosk, credit card, and mobile app revenue. But you see mm -hmm. that there's no mm -hmm. budgeted revenue, but there's revenue that has come in. What I'm <coughs> going to do is line the column that says revenue. Uh, the, not the column that says actual revenue, the revised estimated revenue. And I'm going to look at last year's totals for those and, make, and take the same amount of parking revenue, divide it among those six lines instead yep. of four. I see what you mean. And that will correct all the percentages. I see what you mean. Any other questions for the finance director about what the numbers look like? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have some financial orders. The first is 18176. It's an order to reprogram Academy of Music Capital Project Surplus to the Academy of Music Stage and Capital Access Project. Whereas the same appropriate funds to make the stage or access at the Academy of Music handicapped accessible. And the project was bid in the spring of 2018. And whereas the bids received exceeded the approved budget and the project was put on hold in order to review and rebid once additional funds were identified. And whereas other Academy of Music capital projects have been completed and have funds remaining that are now surplus, uh, therefore it be ordered that $41,991 of the remaining balance in the Academy of Music Foundation Repairs capital project um, and $2,491 of the remaining balance in the Academy of Music Dressing Room Repair Capital Project be reprogrammed to add to the $87,045 previously appropriated for the Academy of Music Stage Door Handicapped Access Project, bringing the total amount appropriated for the Stage Door Handicapped Access Project to $131,527. So we have a motion in finance? Motion. Second. Second. And the mayor is here to answer any questions. Sort of self explanatory. Um, the project originally began with us trying to fix some unsafe granite steps, and then we, um, we wanted to look into the issue of trying to make it uh, actually a handicapped accessible entrance because right now 
um, backstage access at the academy. That's the only way to get backstage. Um, so it's uh, so it's important uh, for performers who need handicap accessibility. So as the order said, we worked with a designer and uh, attempted to achieve that um, with the funds that we had, and uh, and the bids came in a little high. So we're going to try to rebid it again. Uh, but we want to take these excess funds from these other smaller capital projects at the academy to move them into the ad accounts, and hopefully we'll have enough to, uh, to complete the project. Uh, is this um, this new total approximate what you were, the feedback you were getting on the bids? It, it does, although we're going to do a little bit of um, you know we're going to do a little bit of value engineering right. on it. Um, it. You know, it's a challenge because it's a historic building, right. so you know you just can't slap any old uh, yeah, a pressure treated exactly. ramp on yes. that yet. Um, so it's we're mindful of that, um, but but luckily you know the the uh, board of directors is is mindful of the cost and. You know, we have a president who's a, the president of the board is also a president at O'Connell Engineering, and so he's very committed to help <coughs> us work with us to come up with a, a project that'll stay under budget. So we're hoping this will be enough to accomplish the project and try to make every effort to do that. So. Other questions for the mayor on this one? And again, all the, the funds involved had previously been committed to the academy for yes. other projects in their surplus. Yes. Some of you may have recently seen the completion of the foundation repairs that we did, which was a result of the work we did at the back of Plastic Park and the loading dock, and so mm -hmm. it uncovered some foundational yeah, that issues. Very nice, so. Yeah, so, um, and then those of you who've been backstage, we've tried to do some upgrades to the dressing rooms and bathrooms and um, you know, kind of bring it a little bit the century. Um, there's some, there were some issues there, so we wanted to, to tackle those too. It is a municipally owned uh, theater, which a lot of times that's a surprise to people but it is a municipally owned theater, so we want to work with the, uh, with the board to make sure that we keep the facility to repair. Um, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. No, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, the next is 18177. It's an order to increase senior tax work off program maximum abatements. Order that whereas the legislature authorized the establishment of a program that provides for property tax liability reduction in exchange for volunteer services for persons over the age of 60, and whereas the mayor and the city council accepted the provisions of Mass General Law, uh, Chapter 59, Section 5K, on June 19th of 2014, establishing a senior work off abatement program to allow persons over the age of 60 to volunteer to provide services to the city. In exchange for such volunteer services, the city reduced by no more than $1,000 per year their real property tax obligations. And whereas the legislature amended Mass General Law Chapter 59, Section 5K, effective November 7, 2016, raising the amount of the allowable reduction of real estate property tax bills. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the City Council hereby accepts the provision of Mass General Law, Chapter 59, Section 5K, as amended, establishing a senior work off abatement of program to allow persons over the age of 60 to volunteer, provide service to the City at an hourly rate consistent with the current minimum wage of the Commonwealth. And in exchange for such voucher services, the City shall reduce the real property tax obligations of such persons uh, by an amount not to exceed $1,500 per year. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. Okay. Questions from the mayor on this one? This is a, um, this is actually a result of the Municipal Modernization Act bill. Um, and you may recall uh, at the start of I guess, my second term, I proposed that the city accept this state law and we started a senior and veteran tax work off program. Um, the issue was back when they, it was originally $1,000 was the maximum abatement. Um, and we've been working under that program. Um, the Munis uh, Municipal Modernization Act, which is cited here, um, raised it to 1500 um, The problem is the veteran component of the tax work on program was in a separate piece of legislation um, that did not get raised, that didn't get successfully passed by the end of, the, um, by the end of that term. And so um, we did not, we wanted to wait until both of them had been raised to 1500 so that when we made the change that both our programs for seniors and for veterans. So, um, so this is sort of a two-parter. So you'll see we're going to raise the senior up um, based on that law, um, and then 
most recently, the legislature finally updated what's called the Valor Act, which is a sort of an omnibus veterans bill that had gotten hung up in the legislature um, and finally raised the veteran work off to 1500. So that's why we're bringing it forward now to raise both of them uh, to 1500. <laughs> How many veterans do you have that are in the profession? So we have, you know, we have about, um, I think we had about 40 to 45 the tax work off participants this year. And generally it's about five, about five, to, five, six five, five to six the veterans that participate. Mm -hmm. um, and they work um, through the, usually the, the veterans office works on helping them find placement. The programs are a little different because um, under, traditional senior tax work off program, there's um, income requirements. You know, we have certain income requirements that we set. Um, and the veteran program is there's no income requirement. But, and that's part of the state law. Um, we, we're not allowed to set any income requirements. But, um, you know, I know Steve Connor and his staff do a lot of outreach to veterans to try to make them know about this program. So uh, we have had several that have participated over now the five plus years we've it's been slowly growing from the first year, um, and many of them are working in city departments or city libraries or city schools, and um, it's been a, I think it's been a great program for an opportunity for seniors and veterans to be able to give up some of their expertise and work off some of their property tax bill. Any other questions from the mayor on this one? All right, no, hearing none, then to the seniors one, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and the next one is 18178, and this is the uh, Veterans Tax Work Off. Um, order that words, the legislature authorize the establishment of a program that provides for property tax liability reduction in exchange for volunteer service for veterans, whereas the mayor and the council accept the general law, chapter 59, section 5N. On June 19th, 2014, establishing a veterans work off abatement program to allow veterans to volunteer to provide services to the city. In exchange for such volunteer services, the city reduced by no more than $1,000 per year their real estate property tax obligations. And whereas the legislature amended Mass General Law Chapter 56, Section 5, and effective November 7th, 2018, raising the amount of the allowable real estate property tax bill. Now, therefore, it be ordered. The City Council hereby accepts the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 58, Section 5N, as amended establishing a veterans work off program to allow veterans to volunteer to provide services to the city in an hourly rate consistent with the current minimum wage of the Commonwealth in exchange such volunteer services. Um, the city shall reduce the real estate property tax obligation of such persons not to exceed $1,500 a year. Do we have a motion? And second. Second. And I think we already talked about this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any additional questions, Councilor Barge? How many hours a week do they work? Um, they're only allowed to work, under so. 25 under this program. Yeah. It was 100 under. Yeah, so the way the law works is that you the, the hours are, you have to use the current minimum wage in the state. And so, um, so you basically take the minimum wage and multiply it by the number of hours you need to get to you know, the $1,000. In this case, it'll be 1500 so it'll be how many hours? 125. 125 at hours. At 12. For both the veterans and? Yes. At 12. At the new $12 an hour minimum wage. Obviously, as the minimum wage goes up, then the number of hours will go down. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we're, we're going to see that go up the next several years to mm -hmm. 15, eventually. So, um, which it will be a nice, two nice round numbers at that mm -hmm. point. If they only choose to work for work a certain a percentage of the hours, do they get? Yep. Okay, so it's you yeah, don't have to do. It's not all or nothing. Some people don't get all the way to the max. But, right. And, um, yeah. Work a little or as much as they want. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Then, uh, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The next is eighteen one eighty in order to authorize a pilot agreement. With, uh, with my cold, I can hardly pronounce it. Syncarpa Solar LLC. Whereas a solar electric generating facility has been proposed for privately owned property on Park Hill Road by Syncarpa Solar LLC, uh, which property is owned as parcel map 12, lot 1 on assessor's map 29, whereas the developer requires an accurate projection of the prospective expenses 
with respect to real estate and personal property taxes uh, that are taxable under law. And whereas, given the difficulty in determining the taxable value of solar electric generating facilities, it is the city's interest to have an agreement whereby the city is assured of a fixed stream of income tax or tax income from the project. And whereas, <coughs> it's in the best interest of the city and the developers to enter into an agreement fixing the payments that will be made with respect to all taxable real and personal property uh, incorporated within the project for the term of the agreement, order that the mayor is authorized to negotiate and execute a pilot agreement pursuant to Mass General Law Section 59, Section 58H B with Syncarpa Sin Solar LLC for a 4.2 megawatt direct current facility on a parcel of land totaling 32 acres located on Park Hill Road, assessor's map 39, parcel 12 dash 001 on such terms that and conditions mm -hmm. that the mayor deems advisable. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. Okay. Questions for the mayor on this one? This is sort of a carbon copy of the order that you uh, we discussed and, and you approved a couple of uh, over the last two council meetings. Um, this is actually a project you sort of had a peripheral vote on it because the, there was a right of first refusal on chapter land that Mr. Fyden came forward to you on in the councilor's ward. And so, um, so anyway, they've, they've reached out to us about um, discussing the pilot. Um, and so that's why I wanted to get this in process. Um, all the same issues and challenges that we talked about before. Um, and so we're gonna try to work with them to, uh, to come up with something so that both they and we have sort of a, a firm understanding over the, over the course of the project. So, I mean, this is part of the weirdness of this. So, so you have to, uh, with each pending solar project on private land, you have to negotiate these pilots with the uh, with the the LLCs. So, I, I, you put you at somewhat of a disadvantage because whatever contract you lock in initially, the I'm sure any future applicants will be referring to that. It is, yeah. And, so and, I'm, I'm and I'm mindful of that, and there, I, we haven't actually finalized the other, we haven't, right. the other one that you gave me approval for, we're not, you know, they are still going through some zoning related issues. Um, so it's a, you know, it's an interesting, you're, yeah, I yeah. know where you're going on this. <laughs> so we're, we obviously are, we're doing a lot of research on other agreements and looking at sort of like per kilowatt hour costs that are, are embedded in some of these pilot agreements. And so that's sort of the basis of our conversations. And obviously, you know, we'd like to have them sort of be consistent. Right. There have been changes over pilot agreements over time. You can kind of see them markedly, particularly now that, you know, the, the, they're transitioning to this new SMART program, um, which is the new version of like the whole SREX program. Right. Um, and so some of the, um, some of the, tax benefits are lower than they were before um, in the early going. And so, so there's some of those things to factor in. There's construction costs, there's the cost of the panel. So we're trying to get as much information from them. They're obvious, you know, their position is obviously that, you know, we're, you know, the industry's changed and this is a different ball game. And so we're, we're looking at other agreements and trying to suss it out, but it is very difficult to do. Um, but again, the reason we're in this situation is because um, there's not a clear, clearly updated and modern law about how municipalities assess these projects. And until we have something like that, this is the really the clearest course. Okay. So Unless we uh, spend our time in the ATB, you know, going to the ATB to write right. about it. Right. So. Um, no, I, I I certainly understand the impetus. Yeah. And this particular developer, um, you know, helpfully sent me the three latest copies of the three latest ATB cases, just in case I have Just in case. <laughs> 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 That's so thoughtful of them. That's so they you know who has the upper, you know, some of, of an upper hand in this, in this uh, process, so. So as I recall from the last one, one of the major components in your analysis as to what to do is what you estimate the property tax would be exactly. if it was conventionally taxed. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, that's one of the things you consider so that there's some relation between what we think we would be due if this wasn't all clouded up by a 70s vintage state law. Yeah. You know, what we'd be getting if we could property tax them cleanly, mm -hmm. and, and that goes into figuring what the pilot should be, and they know that as well. I they do. They yeah, do. So. They, they totally 
And if the if, if all of a sudden that law gets changed, they get whacked with a property tax bill they couldn't fight. Mm -hmm. it's a, yeah, so it's the, there, there's definitely a, a balancing act there. Well, but, well just I wanted to expand. My point on this, of course, is that um, you know, not everyone gets to negotiate their taxes, and uh, either corporately or individually, and that the the state the state's inability to accommodate or address us in any fashion that would actually allow cities to be more fair or at least have a reasonable expectation of what they can assess as opposed to going into this blind and then negotiating from a point of weakness and and I, I mean I'm all for the solar industry but they they're and I would understand if I owned a business I would take full advantage of the opportunity to try to pay as little as possible but uh, at the same time and this is not a question it's a commentary I just think the the, the state really has kind of handcuffed us in, um, and at the same time has created a, a, and it's not, this isn't unique to this industry, obviously, but we, but in this instance, it's it's kind of played out pretty clearly that there is, there is, uh, there's a big mess that the state doesn't seem to be willing to, uh, to, to face and, and as usual, as per usual, the consequences are borne by the smaller communities that are trying to keep up. Yep. Okay. Like Airbnb and like yeah, no, there are a lot of shiny objects stuff. in the, yeah. yeah. They, I understand marijuana is going to be legal sometime soon too, so yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so your point's well taken and hopefully a <laughs> legislative solution, and, but for now this is the, the course we have. So this is, just, again, just the same sort of boilerplate giving me the authorization to negotiate. <coughs> so we hope we can encourage our new senator and representative that if they get around to fixing this and it is advantageous to cities and towns mm -hmm. that they allow us to reopen this once they fix the law, mm -hmm. we can level the playing field if, in fact, we discover it isn't level. That's right. Um, any other discussion on this one? Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 All right, the next is 18181 to purchase 119 acres on Marble Brook in Leeds. Order that whereas the open space recreation plan 2011 to 18 recommends preserve econo economically viable land and fill gaps between protected land in the Mineral Hills and Marble Brook. And whereas the city is negotiation and negotiations to purchase 119 acres of valuable wildlife and plant habitat uh, that includes over half a mile of Marble Brook and abuts existing open space permanently protected with conservation restrictions. Order that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Mass General Law Chapter 40, subsection 8C. Any fee, easement, or conservation restriction as defined in Mass General Law. 184 subsection 31 or any other interests in the above land and any immediately adjoining land that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restrictions that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to contract for and expend any federal, state or other aid available for this project including any grant from the Division of Conservation Services of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs including the Landscape Partnership Grant Program with such related restrictions and, ag and agreements as the city determines agreeable. Further, that $120,000 is approved for such acquisition and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow the $120,000 under Mass General Law Section 44, Subsection 7, and the Conservation Commission is authorized to contract for any federal, state, or other aid available for this project, including any grant from the Division of Conservation Services of the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, further that any grants, donations, or sales shall be used to reimburse the open space funds used for the pur purpose. Do we have a motion to finance? I have a motion. A second. And is this the one of Sarah's? Yes, Sarah. You want to give us a quick presentation sure. and we'll ask uh, you questions. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is an exciting project. As the resolution noted, or the order noted, it abuts existing protected open space. Uh, although this couldn't be developed into a single family home or anything else, there is, as is the case with a lot of forest and open parcels, this could be extensively logged without any review from the city and would eliminate the view shed on 
one of the highest, if not the highest part of peak in Northampton. Um, so harming this visible hilltop and harming habitat and resource area. It's funded in large part through an already received state grant that we're working in partnership with the Kestrel Land Trust on. They will also hold a conservation restriction on the property to just make doubly sure that it's permanently protected. The order includes borrowing authority for the required local match for this grant, as is typical with these types of things that will never be utilized. Um, we'll request CPA funds for the local match and seek donations as well. Um, and although it is, on paper it looks like it's landlocked, it does include an access easement from Kennedy Road, and we also hope to continue to fill in gaps with future acquisitions. Mm -hmm. So questions for uh, Sarah on this one? Councillor. I, I'm having a hard time about where is this located? If you come down by the end of Sylvester Road, Sarah, yes. go straight across to over the bridge. Yep. Is it further down on the left-hand side of that road on Kennedy Road? If you're going north, yeah. uh, it would be on your left towards the right. Right, okay. This, uh, Councilor Bartz, this property belongs to Garson Fields and his sister, gotcha. and it's located behind their, from behind their house down to the brook yeah. in West Hampton. Okay, yeah. I thought so. Yeah, that's I'm fine. Uh, Councilor? Um, I'm wondering if there's any way to include a provision that will um, keep this parcel from becoming a place that hunting is suggested for it? Uh, that would, I mean, that would be up to the, the council to decide that. That has been done in the past, and in, in a few instances, it seemed like that uh, either hunting or no hunting really made, made sense at that time, and the council later came back to revisit that, but that's within the council's purview to decide. We, we generally don't want to do that just because change. Other questions for Sarah? Hearing none, then uh, Councilor, are you all set? Yeah, okay, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Uh, the next is 18182, and this is an order authorizing acquisition of an easement for Garfield <laughs> Avenue. Um, and this is a kind of a modified thing we've seen before, but the mayor can explain why we're doing it again. Whereas by order um, 18, 024, the City Council voted uh, to lay out and accept the public way that parcel of land shown on Garfield Avenue extension. Uh, it's 3,082.4 square feet on a plan entitled Commonwealth of Massachusetts Street Acceptance Plan of Garfield Avenue Extension prepared for the City of Northampton, mm -hmm. Hampshire County dated March 6, 2017. Whereas in order to complete the layout, of the extension to Garfield Avenue, the City Council must authorize the acquisition of the land. Now, if it, therefore, it be ordered, uh, the City Council hereby authorizes the acquisition by purchase gift, eminent domain, or otherwise, and that the parcel of land is shown as Garfield Avenue extension. It's 3,082.4 square feet, plus or minus, on a plan entitled Commonwealth of Massachusetts Street Acceptance Plan of Garfield Avenue extension, prepared for the City of Northampton, Hampshire County, dated March 6. 2017, no appropriation is needed for the acquisition. Do we have a motion of finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. And the mayor can explain why we're revisiting this. It's really, I think it's really just to correct an order that had been previously passed. It's, there's some narrative in your agenda that explains it. Um, mm -hmm. You had acted to lay out and accept Garfield Avenue as a public way. Um, and then there was an approval of a Garfield Avenue taking back in May. And again, we're talking about the little section of Garfield Avenue at the end of the street um, that still was uh, heretofore was under the control of Habitat and they were maintaining it. So we wanted to just make the full public way complete. Um, and so um, I believe that the uh, language that was used back in that May order um, did not have the proper wording. And so we're trying to bring it back to you to get the proper wording. Um, because winter is coming and, and habitat otherwise will be responsible for plowing this little clump at the end of uh, Garfield Avenue. Yeah, it, it, as I understand it, in the previous order, we authorized you to acquire it. Mm -hmm. yes. But if it's a taking, we have to do it. Exactly. The, the, the legislative body has to do a taking. So all, really the big change is rather than authorizing you to do it, yeah. we're taking it because that's our authority, not the mayor's. Exactly. 
I'll, I'll file it at the Registry of Deeds for you, but I'll yeah, do all that. Do the legwork. <laughs> okay. We got to, it's got to be our action, not yours. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for the mayor on this one? Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommend recommendation in finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And again, we are requesting two meetings if possible, and just so that we can, so that Habitat knows it doesn't have to hire a snow plowing company for, not that it's going to snow in November, but. Never can tell. It's going to snow at the end of October. Right? Frost on her. And that order of taking will For signature by all members to be. After the council yeah. votes, yeah. Um, the next is 18185. Uh, this is an order to reprogram radio hardware funds for radio hardware and radio consulting services. Order that funds appropriated by the City Council from the Capital Sta Stabilization Fund in April 2017 of $200,000 and in March of 2018 of $150,000, the purchase of radio hardware for public safety communications. Uh, that the purpose be expanded to include both radio consulting services as well as the purchase of the hardware. Do we have a motion to finance? Second. 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 Any questions for the mayor on this one? This is just we're we're trying to the lang the, the the plain language of that of those two capital orders was just to purchase equipment, and um, we given these are this is part of our ongoing and larger public safety radio upgrades and reconfiguration. Um, we need some technical assistance on some of the work that we're trying to do. So we want to be able to also uh, be able, as part of this, sort of like you hire an engineer to help you, you know, build a bridge. And so we'd ask you for design and construction monies. We need some design help with this, with these acquisitions. So we wanted to expand the definition to include the consulting and purchase of the radio hardware. And just to remind everybody from, from Capital Improvements, for years Capital Improvements has wanted to get police, fire, DPW, all the radio people coordinated with one vendor with matching equipment with all the frequencies laid out properly. And the frequencies have to be changed because of everything getting digitized. So the goal is to get one contractor to set it all up, matching equipment for everybody so they can talk to each other, and one set of towers and so forth. It's a very sensible, sensible and this thing. Is this is sort of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. It's a bigger project, but mm -hmm. this is sort of the first step yeah. that we're working on now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Um, any other questions for the mayor on this one? Then hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 And the last one is 18188. This is an order to appropriate $75,000 in CPA funds for, for housing for homeless youth. Order that whereas uh, Dial Self submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the Housing for Homeless Youth Project, and whereas uh, currently this population faces a gap in support of housing services in Northampton and nearby, despite being a high-risk group and the project has wide community support, uh, whereas the Community Preservation Act funds have contributed to the purchase of the parcel and these additional expended funds are necessary to fill a critical funding gap for construction, and whereas Western Massachusetts Network to End Homelessness has declared uh, unaccompanied, unaccompanied homeless youth a priority in its regional plan, and whereas the CPA funds will leverage up to $475,000 of funds from other sources, and whereas on June 11, 2018, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted 6 to 2 to recommend that the $75,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support the project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $75,000 be appropriated from Community Present Preservation Act funding to dial self for the Housing for Homeless Youth Project for the creation of six to eight affordable housing units and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council, specifically uh, the $75,000.10 is appropriated <laughs> from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve Account. Do we have a motion in finance? Move positive recommendation. Second. 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 Uh, Sarah, you want to? You're the CPA. So first note you that change your hat. Cents, the ten cents should not be there. So <laughs> the ten cents needs to, needs to be removed from the final order. Um, so this is the project that's under construction on Hatfield Street. I came before you two years it's ago. So it's actually on Locust Street across from Smith Folk, right? The yes. So yeah. the very beginning of, of yeah. Hatfield Street. Yeah. 
Um, so I came before you two years ago to allocate initial funding for purchase of the parcel. CPA funds were some of the first dollars in at that point, so there were a lot of unknowns about the details of the project. As those details started to get fleshed out, Dial Self realized that they had a, a funding gap for construction. They came before the CPA, uh, CPC to request expedited funding. The reason for the delay between June and now is we, we just didn't have those funds available in our accounts. Um, so we're, I'm asking for two meetings tonight if, uh, if the council agrees that makes sense. Um, so basically this is just to get the project, get, keep going through the winter, not have to stop and remobilize again in the spring and get the units online as soon as possible. Councilor uh, Dwight? As Council Murphy noted, the foundation's already poured, right? It is. But they, yes. So they, they, yeah, and I talked to Rick Hart, and he was saying that yeah, they're kind of anxious to, to get moving and, and optimistic at the prospect. So. Yes, so these funds will allow construction to start now and continue over the winter. Otherwise, the foundation will need to be stabilized in the, right. and work will stop. And uh, additional expenses would be incurred, yes. as you said, to try and prepare <coughs> the foundation space. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Klein, you had a question. Um, I see it was a six to two vote in the CPC, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the conversation there and sure. why the vote um, was. So the, the committee agreed to a person that this is a tremendously important project and, and absolutely needs to go forward and be funded. There was a little bit of concern about a request for expedited funds that early in the fiscal year, actually not, not even the start of the fiscal year, uh, so the committee didn't know what was coming before them. Um, they were they had concerns about spending any amount of funds before knowing what else would come in for applications and there was also some concern about um, the way the project developed that because they had been involved so early and they didn't know a lot of details there was there was a large gap in between the initial application and, and this next one and they they were they had hoped that there would be some more communication but I think that will all be worked out during the construction process. They all agreed it's tremendously important and, and should move forward. So the two votes weren't against the project. It was just against the, uh, the, the way things had transpired, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor. So why don't we specify where this is happening? Uh, we certainly could. Um, I'm just. We, I, I, we no, used just the, the, the previous order as a template, okay. and it hadn't been known at that point, but that certainly could be added. Certainly is there. It is. <laughs> um, any other questions for uh, Laura on this project? Oh. Sarah. Sarah. Get rid of the dime. Then, uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll lose the dime. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. We call it a Scribner's error. Uh, then, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Close. Thank you. And uh, I know of no new business. Uh, my voice made it through. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll deal with some of these financial orders. Eight one seven in order reprogram. Can we use a capital project surplus or can we use a stage door and get access capital project? Motion for first reading. So moved. Second. 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 Second by Council of the Barge. Any discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Council of the Barge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 Um, now that I think about it, is there any um, desire to take the two items that uh, Ms. LaValle is here for up next in case she might want to leave after we're finished? Um, so sure. the first one would be um, uh, e 18181 order to approve the purchase of 119 acres on Marble Brook and Leeds. So motion to approve this. So moved. Second. And seconded. Um, any other discussion or questions? Discussed pretty thoroughly in finance. Uh, so I ask for a roll call. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Okay, so that is approved in the first reading. Um, I'd ask how we go to H, which is 18188, in order to appropriate $75,000 in CPA funds for housing for homeless youth projects. Move to approve. Made and seconded. Uh, any questions or discussion? Uh, Councillor uh, Dwight and then Councillor Didwell. Sarah, is there a need for uh, two votes <laughs> on this? 
for? Uh, dial self has indicated that the two votes at this time would, would greatly be appreciated in, in starting construction. That's what I figured. Okay, thank you. For which one? For the, this item, item 18.188, the money for dial self, the $75,000 CPA fund set. Uh, I thought the suggestion about identifying the parcel did, in fact, make sense. Do we want to um, uh, make a simple amendment to identify it? First, the part, do we have a, or maybe we don't have a uh, assessor's map, a uh, way of identifying it right here and now, or just, it's, it's on Locust, 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 yeah. Locust, Locust and Hatfield. Not quite Hatfield, actually. It's, it's two. one, one yeah. lot in Hatfield. Yeah. I, I think the actual. Yeah, the, the number is on. on so the, oh, so the main entrance would be. Because of the driveway. Okay. So it does face, a portion of it face face it's locus, but the, the main access. In the vicinity of, perhaps. In the, in the vicinity of Locust and Hatfield Street or I something. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. So I'd second that amendment. Okay. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Uh, and so this is going to go, what we just said, it would be the parcel located in the vicinity. That's what yes. it is, correct? Okay. Uh, thank you. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any abstention? So that's approved. Now to the order itself. Any further discussion? So moved. Uh, so yeah, we have it on the floor, so I'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Kine? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Kine? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. Yes. A motion to suspend, to suspend rules. Yes. Seconded by Councilor LaBarge. Any discussion on suspension of rules to allow for two readings? Uh, if not, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So it's approved. Move to second reading, please. Second. Second, second. second by Councilor Bidwell. Any discussion on second reading? Uh, roll call. Okay. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Kine? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Yes. And Councilor Nash? Yes. Approved on second reading. So um, let's go back up to B and C. Is there a motion to take both 18177, which is an order to increase senior tax work off program maximum abatement, and 18178, in order to increase veterans tax work off program maximum abatement, uh, together as a group for approval on first reading? As a group, please. Second. Okay. Made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by. Council Barge, any discussion on these two orders? They, it's great to be able to do this. Um, so I'll ask for a roll call. Okay, Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. And Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. So it's approved on first reading. Next, 18180. In order to authorize payment in lieu of taxes agreement uh, with Syncarfa Solar LLC. Motion to approve this? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the approval? Um, roll call. Okay. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. 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 Councilor Yes. And Councilor Shea. Yes. That's uh, approved. Now we come to 18182, in order authorizing acquisition of easements for Garfield Avenue extension. Is there a motion to approve this? Approved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, yep, this is just a technical thing that we have to do, and I thank the administrative assistant of the city council who, who caught the issue. Um, so it sounds like we're ready to have a vote. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarre? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Suspend the rule. Second on suspending the rules. Second. Second by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on uh, suspending mm -hmm. the rules? Uh, all those in favor of suspending the rules say aye. 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 Any abstentions? So, um, motion. Second reading, please. Second. Okay. Made by Councillor Dwight. Second by Councillor Barge. Any discussion on second reading? Then we'll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Barge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Yes. Okay, so that is proven second reading. If you if you would like a map and lot reference for that yeah, you get housing that? thing, I have one. Oh. Too late. B23B032. Good. 
Good for the record. No. 23B Hatfield is your street. Street. Hatfield Street. Hmm? I oh. found it. In, it's 11 Hatfield Street. Is the actual street. Now we really know where. <laughs> <laughs> we said in the vicinity of Hatfield Locust. Yeah. Good enough. It does correct. cover it. Very yeah. good. Very good. But thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we're at uh, 18185 in order to program radio hardware funds for radio hardware and radio consulting. Motion approved. to approve. And a second from who? Me. Second. Mr. Bidwell. Any discussion? Oh. Uh, <laughs> better luck next time. Uh, Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sharon. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Thank you. Um, an order on second reading, 18171, order authorizing acquisition of easements for Avis Circle. Motion on this? Move to approve. Second. Very good. Any discussion on this, uh, e uh, this order? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sharon? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. 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 So that's approved, and there's, there are two things for all of us to sign after this orders of taking. So don't run to the donut place that quickly. Stay just a little bit longer. Uh, we need your signature. There are three ordinances who, which have not been referred. Um, I meant they all go to legislative matters, but they may go to other places too. So we'll just look at them individually. 18179. An ordinance to amend Chapter 350-11.5, B2, Site Plan Submittal Requirements. Um, so it looks like that's going to go to planning and legislative matters. And desire for other things? Um, do I hear a motion to refer to those? So move to, I would like to move those. Seconded by? Second. Councilor Nash got that one. Sorry, sorry. Any discussion? Just focus on looking at them. All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? So that is referred. Next, 18183, ordinance relative to no parking in grass, plots, and tree belts, also known as the get off the city's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> um, this ought to be referred to legislative matters. And um, they come from. T oh, this came from. This has come from. That's right. Yeah. No. Uh, no. Going okay, to yes. TPC. Uh, TPC. Requested TPC. referral yeah. to TPC. TPC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yep. Okay, very good. So those two, TPC and Legislative Matters, anywhere else? So do I hear a motion on so those moved. two? Seconded by? Second. Councilor Dwight, any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So that is referred. Where does it go into the Legislative Matters and Transportation Park. Mm -hmm. um, next, 18184, an ordinance to amend Chapter 5 of the Code of Ordinances by adding Section 5 7, um, designating certain positions as municipal employees. Um, to legislative matters. Move referral to legislative matters. Okay. Second. Seconded by Councilor Shara. Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Very good. So that's referred. Um, now we have stuff we can vote on. Um, these are ordinances. 18123, an ordinance to amend Chapter 312 110 of the Code Book. Um, this is relative to Strong Avenue. And uh, I'll give you the the gist of it as best I can here. Let's see. Okay. This received um, a positive recommendation from both transportation and parking and legislative matters. Um, this would modify the off-street parking area, Strong Avenue lot, on the southerly side of Strong Avenue. Um, the entire lot for the portions of the lot facing the rear of built the facing rear buildings. What it would do is change the time limit and class of the parking area from two hours, class one B, to three hours, class one F. So I hear a motion on this for so the discussion. Moved. And seconded by Councillor Barge, it sounds like. So um, so uh, Councillor Klein. Uh, question I guess for the mayor, if nobody else. Sure. Um, it came up in legislative matters. We just had a question about the um, except for the 
portions of the lot facing the rear of buildings, or maybe Councilor Nash would know the answer. Why and how is that going to be? How will they be designated as different than the rest of the lot? Um, those are longer term uh, parking spots. The, the, it's actually like a longer term, like 10 hour area oh. on those spaces. Um, so those are already designated for longer term parking. And um, mm -hmm. it actually is somewhat of a, there's, it sort of provides a little bit of employee-ish parking in that sort of part of downtown. So we're really just talking about where there's currently meters, the metered areas. Um, as you sort of go around that little loop in East Side Grill parking lot is what we're really talking about. Um, and this is to kind of align it with what we did in the Armory Street lot and the Masonic Street lot, where we went, from, where we moved Main Street from one hour to two hour. We moved those lots from two hours to three hours. Um, and, um, and, and we're putting in kiosks to replace the years like we've done elsewhere. So, so that's the difference between that lot. It's not the entire lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Does that square, Councilor Nash? Yeah. Yes, and I, I think we might want to do this in two readings I would tonight like to as well. Two readings, yes. I, okay. There was a, some delays, I think, in this making its way through the process. So, and I'm, and I'm sorry, does it raise the uh, fee? No, it does not. Does not. That, does okay. not. So the class yeah. change doesn't. Just a class change, no fee change. Okay. Yep. Any further discussion on this? So we have it on the floor. I'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Yes. Move to suspend rules. Second. And second, any discussion on suspension of rules? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The abstentions, so rules Move suspended. Second reading, to approve. By Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on second reading? Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. And Councillor Murphy. Yes. There you go. Um, good. Now 18125, an ordinance to amend Chapter 212, 104 of the Code Book. Um, can the, the Chair of Transportation and Parking or the Mayor summarize this? Um, it's basically a column changing the limited time parking rules. Well, actually, I guess what it does is just change from one hour to two hours uh, the parking rules basically for all of downtown Florence. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And so on on streets, oh, Your Honor, do you want to describe it? No, it's just, it's sort of, again, a corollary to what we did with downtown Northampton, where we raised it from one hour to two hour in the downtown so in conversations with the Florence Civic and Business Association and the board, um, they were amenable to increasing the signatures, limiting downtown Florence to two hours as well. So that's really what it does. It's our, both of our downtowns match in terms of the core parking time. So this is no, fee, no fees or meters. No, or meters. no just no. time. <laughs> um, this is Chestnut Street. It's Main Street, Florence. It's Maple Street. Um, well, first. Do we have a motion on this? I have moved to put it on the floor. Okay. Second by Council of the Barge. Um, the Transportation Parking Commission discuss any, I know time to time people say there are parking issues in the Chestnut Street, Main Street area. Did any of those things come up or? Oh, absolutely. And we're, we're going to be looking at that. This is referring to uh, the marked spaces that exist right now in, in, in Florence. Um, but so that's that's a discussion of adding or better defining the parking, and um, yes, we had that discussion, and we will be doing that throughout the winter. Have fun. Yes, we Thank will. You. Um, all right. What any other discussion on the ordinance? Can I have a roll call? Sure. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. So that's approved in the first reading. Uh, the next is 18172, an ordinance relative to parking on Union Street. What this does is add a new uh, limited time parking space, it seems like, on Union Street on the southeasterly side. This is a 15 minute 
space, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, from a point 135 feet southwesterly from Parsons Street to a point 160 feet southwesterly from Parsons Street, and we have a map as well. But is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Okay. Um, Councillor Nash, do you want to sure the purpose of this? Yeah. Uh, so at Bridge Street, the 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 pickup drop off. Uh, struggles at Bridge Street School are pretty well known and that uh, this is you know, uh, this is an attempt to address one of the in a small way part of that problem one of the things that is occurring is that uh, the parking lot at Bridge Street School will fill up during the day mm -hmm. and so parents showing up to drop off a lunch pick up a child um, there there's not an assigned space for parents to just pull up and have 15 minutes to run into school and be able to take care of those things. Um, by designating this, um, this space, parents will be able to do that throughout the day. And hopefully, parents will also be using this space during pickup drop-off time to let their children off and that they can just walk, into, uh, walk onto school property from here. Um, it's, it's a small step towards that bigger pickup drop off problem, but it will uh, uh, address that ongoing problem throughout the day. Councilor uh, It should be noted that this is amended in legislative matters to modify the, <clears throat> the dates that this was in service. Uh, originally it was posted as Monday through Saturday, but as we noted, as some wise person noted, there's no school on Saturday, so we, it was, we amended to say Monday through Friday. Yeah, long-standing <coughs> third ward problem. <laughs> so good. Um, any other discussion? <coughs> we can have a roll. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Yes. Um, we have four ordinances on second reading. The first is. Uh, 18138 uh, ordinance to relative uh, to parking on uh, King Street. Motion on this, second reading? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Also, 15 minute space on King Street. Uh, roll call. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 second reading. Next. Um, 18138, an ordinance relative to parking on a dare place. Second. Any discussion? Um, roll call, whenever we're ready. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Navarro. Yes. Councilor yes. Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's approved in second reading. Next, 18146. An ordinance to amend Chapter 153 Cemeteries. Motion to approve. Move to approve. Everyone just said Everyone that one. Said, I'll right. second it. Then. <laughs> um, so by we can't do it by acclamation. Um, any discussion? Roll call. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Goodell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. That's approved in second reading. Next in the 18153, an ordinance to establish a charter review committee. Is the motion approve this second reading? Second. Second by Councilor Barge, second by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on establishing this committee? Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Dono. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Dono. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. 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 Uh, Second reading. Just, uh, just a point of information that uh, it's actually item 18.152, not 153. That's good. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, good. Any new business today? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Any opposed adjournment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Council.